Hello, dear viewer, and welcome to the PC Gaming Weak Spot pre-show banter. My name is Colin Mahern, and joining me at this time is the wonderful Matthew Castle. Hello, Matthew. The name's Castle. Matthew Castle. <laughs> very good. Very good. But can we hold off in the James Bond chat until oh, later? Okay. Sorry. Because, you know, I mean... But it, if anyone is going to talk about Bond, it is you. Like, you dress like him every single week. So... I look like him. This is basically an audition for Bond. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how would you feel about a reasonably overweight James Bond? I think the world is ready for a, a Bond that wears glasses. I'm just a Bond that likes food. Has a Bond ever worn glasses? Is that... Oh, uh, the, the, I, I think he's probably worn glasses with gadgets in them. Oh, you're probably right. I like, think I've got a, I've got an image of Pierce Brosnan, Golden Eye era, maybe wearing a pair of glasses, reading glass or like sun cool sunglasses type <laughs> of reading thing. Reading glasses. Oh, a Bond without twenty twenty vision. That's uh, James. Uh, but, uh, uh, Daniel Craig wears sunglasses a fair amount. I can, yeah, I'd imagine. I mean, Daniel Craig was kind of the cool Bond, wasn't he? The Bond well, actually, for a new well, era. I've, I've just typed in glasses and Bond, and uh, there's there's pictures of most of the Bonds wearing glasses. Oh. So, right. um, I don't think they're prescription. I think they're just, they're either gadgets or fashion. Um, oh, like the, the, but that would, uh, I mean, I can't I imagine... You can, I can't imagine you, you Roger Moore wearing. Do you know? Do you know those glasses you can get in Top Man that are literally like just the frames type of thing? I don't. I can't imagine Timothy Dalton. Uh, Timothy Dalton wearing them, or they're a very modern thing. No, but there. I don't think you could be a double O agent if you had bad eyesight. It feels like something that that would be like a absolutely not. You know, a bit like how you can't be. A, you can't be a pilot. Because Bond is all things. He is also a bit of a pilot, isn't he? Mm, mm. Did you get glasses later in life? He was or... in the Navy as well, Bond. Oh, wow. wow. Um, you know, he's, but well, he's command... Wasn't he in the Navy? He's Commander Bond. <laughs> he's Commander Bond? Well, yeah, yeah, that's did, what did, call him. Did, um, did you get glasses later in life or was it something... Like, did you always have them? No, no. Uh, when I was Just 17 or 18, little. basically when I was doing my driving test, I couldn't read the number plate good i'm glad you said because i got glasses uh so i need glasses for like the telly and driving uh but i got glasses when i was about 16 i think and it was genuinely like uh, like the 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 move from standard definition to hd it was right. mad i was like yeah this is the best Glasses that that is good, but I also like the reverse now, where I'm walking outside. If I take my glasses off, uh, because they normally pull things a little closer, mm. I gain a little bit of height visually. So I feel like I'm I feel like I'm at my full height when I take my glasses off. <laughs> like I, I feel I feel taller in the world. It's like I've powered up. I've hit my like rage mode. That's... I filled the bar. I hit the button, and then I turn into like Uber Matt. <laughs> that's amazing so your, your glasses maybe you should just get lighter glasses if they're sort of dragging dragging you down no 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 I'm not I, no, I know I'm not saying I know, they drag me I know, you know, <laughs> I know. It, it's the optics of the lens I mean like I'm not like oh, they're so heavy <laughs> they're very light uh, and that is your PC Gaming Week Spot banter for this week so welcome indeed to the PC Gaming Week Spot to the PC Gaming Week Spot, your recap of the last seven days in PC video gaming. My name is Colin Mahern and joining me this week, as always, dressed for the occasion, it is the one, it is the only, it's Mr. Matthew Castle. Da -da, da -da, da -da -da. That's James Bond. Carry on, carry on. I thought we were going to get the... Da -da, da -da, da -da. Can we get any um 
Oh, was this? Diamonds are forever. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, what's what's your go on? What's give me your personal favorite Bond theme then? Oh, guys, that's that's very difficult. Live and let die. What about that? Oh, that's it's, the Guns that N' that Roses version. That okay, that one's great for like a minute, and then it just turns into like the xylophones for two minutes. <laughs> We're going to get a content. This the the vocals on this is so brilliant. We're going to get a content you don't ID. Get a lot of, you don't get a lot of like lyrics. I like more verses about how cool Bond is. Well, I think that Live and Let Die. It just sort of it's good once mm-hmm. it all kicks off, but it it, it sort of stops being the classic Bond. You know. So, where, so where, when you think of a Bond theme, then I'm guessing you think sort of like Shirley Bassey Not or even the really. recent Adele really one. Like, um, uh, Nobody Does It Better. Oh, by, f- very good. Uh, yeah. Who sings that? I can't. Nobody does it's it. Not, you see, you're, you're, applying, hmm? <laughs> you're applying Shirley Bassey to every song. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that at all. Surely Carly Bessie Siren. should do all of them. Right, okay. <laughs> Who's doing is it Billy Billy Eilish is doing the- oh, Yeah, all, all the new ones. I I'm not I'm not mad about the new ones. I actually quite like the Pierce Brosnan era. Uh I quite like Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough, the theme tunes. Oh, you've just reminded me of Golden Eye. That's a, that's <laughs> that's a great a more, one. Like, I'd say Tina Turner's got a bit more of like the like the Shirley Bassey kind of brassiness. That's probably why uh, I like it so much. Yeah. I like t- Tomorrow Never Dies. Is that... Uh, was wait, that Madonna? Gar- gar- no, no. Uh, the World Is Not Enough is garbage, as in the band. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And Tomorrow Never Dies is... I was going to say Shania Twain. It's not Shania Twain. It oh, is, that'd be good if they got... <laughs> it's not. It's... Uh, what the fuck? Oh, God. I know. Sorry, I need to look this up. I can't. I, I'm losing mega bond cred here. That's that's okay. You can gain it all back in a minute. But yeah, who who sang Cheryl that one? Crow. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very uh, the, the art of the film theme song. Like Bond, I feel is the last remaining uh, uh, movie franchise to to really go. And this is the song of this film. Well, you don't you don't get like. Bond films are pretty much the only films these days that have opening credits with all the actors and cast and, you know, crew names, which I always mm. really like. I like a big song at the start of a film, set over mm-hmm. cool lit visuals. People don't Casino, do it. Casino Royale one is, the opening credits of that are terrific. Yeah, so, that one's good. That one, that one's good. I, I don't mind the, the Skyfall song, and I like the credits for that one as well. Mm. Um, but the new one, it's all kind of... Isn't it a bit sort of sad and grumpy, the Billy Eilish one? Is it? I haven't heard it. It's all like, well, her doing her thing. It's not quite my cup. I'm not going to do an impression of it because it would offend our younger viewers. Is it? Does it sound like Shirley Bassey? Because if it doesn't... No, um, it's it's very like... I don't don't know. Like, I I just don't get the impression Billy Eilish is someone who would necessarily like Bond films. She seems like someone who'd roll her eyes at them. But then I think that she probably rolls her eyes at most things is the impression I get. She just reminds me of like my young teenage sisters a bit too much. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Just cause, yeah, well, that's her sort of vibe, isn't it? Mm. She's like very normal down to earth. And it's the kind of like, if I talk about Bond to my little sisters, they're like, oh God. Boring Bond, old something man. something dad's mm. like. Mm. <laughs> But. Well, <laughs> before we get on to Bond <laughs> in a greater sense, this is a a video podcast about video games. So, Matthew, uh, yes, before we get on to Bond, I am going to ask you to get that crank out and open that news gob of yours because I've got some information snacks for you. Nom, 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 Info nom, snacks nom, 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 for his gob. <sighs> so... Ooh. Uh, we're going to start off with a story that I sort of debated whether we were going to go into it, and I've decided no. Uh, but you know, oh. I'll, give, I'll give it a mention anyway. There was a Capcom leak over about two weeks ago, I think, uh, but a screenshot from this leak uh, was doing the rounds on the internet in the past seven days, um, and it, it outlines 
Capcom slate for like the next four or five years, really. Uh, other websites have gone into detail and told you the games mentioned. I feel like because the means used to uh, bring this information to the public were more than untoward, uh, probably Criminal. just going to leave it at that. Yes, indeed. Um, there was stuff in there I was excited about. I won't say what they are. Uh, but there were some there were some pleasant surprises. Uh, mm. But yeah, it is it is a bit rotten. It's kind of like you know, on a side note, that Nintendo Giga leak that people were talking about. I I was like, oh, this feels a little bit like I suppose it's different because maybe they're older games, but it did still feel a little bit odd to have all these people going, oh look, it's whatever. Here's this character in Donkey Kong, and it was just like, I don't know, feels a little bit odd when these. Uh, yeah, criminals, I suppose, um, unearthed all these things. But yeah, anyway, if you want to yeah. know any of those Capcom stuff, you can find it elsewhere. Um, according to a listing on the Microsoft Store, Far Cry 6 will launch on the 26th of May 2021. Nothing has been confirmed yet, but it's probably going to be around then and may even be that exact date because often when these store listings pop up, they're bang on. So... We'll see. We'll see. Are you excited um, for Far Cry 6? I am. I am because, uh, well, I'm a big fan of Gus Fring and I'd imagine he, Giancarlo Esposito, he has surely chatted to Michael Mando on the set of Better Call Saul and been like, tell me, tell me, Mike, how do I turn myself into this cult figure in video games? I want to become a baddie on the level of, of Vass. So he's probably got a do couple of pointers. Do we still talk about Vass? Oh, we still talk about Vass. Do we? We he feels do. Very of, he feels very of his time. Like, less than ten years? Like, seven, yeah. six, seven years? Yeah, like, I don't, like, I don't regularly think on him. I'm not, like, I don't wake up in the morning, I'm like, Vass! <laughs> I mean, is yeah. there any video game character where you, the, your first thought is, yes. Yeah. Fox I'm McCloud. Like, like you know what? Like, Birdo! <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's more of a scream Birdo! <laughs> Rightfully so um, Other video games that are coming in 2021 Include uh, The Artful Escape, Last Stop And 12 Minutes Publisher Annapurna Interactive Announced these uh, delays Because these were all meant to be coming out in 2020 uh, They announced them on Twitter recently Saying basically, we're in December, we're coming up to December now. These games aren't coming out if you haven't noticed, but they'll be coming out next year. 12 Minutes is the one out of those three. I've spoken about it on the show before, where it's like Willem Dafoe, Daisy Ridley, and uh, McAvoy. So I'm like very intrigued by I that. Am, the one I am excited for is The Artful Escape. That looks cool, I, play, yeah. I played it at E3 about three oh. years ago, maybe even longer, and it was rad as hell. It's like a playable prog rock album, and it's just. Oh, I mean, King Crimson. All the kids uh, big into them no, these it's, days. It's it's absolute. Like the demo of it was absolutely wild. Um, I cannot wait. I think that game is going to be amazing. Hmm. Very good. Uh, Embracer Group. Are you familiar with them, Matthew? You're probably not, because I'm not. I nobody is. But. That's the parent company of THQ Nordic. And they have once again been hoovering up many studios, uh, 13 in total, was announced in the last week. Um, a number of them people probably wouldn't be aware of, but the ones that people might know include Flying Hog, which is the developer behind Shadow Warrior, Zen Studios, which is the pinball one, and Snapshot Games, who uh, made Phoenix Point. You played Phoenix Point, didn't you? I have that in my uh, head. Yeah, I'll, yeah I've, I've played games by all those studios. Um, I had not heard this news at all. But they're all quite good um, acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I there, think, there, there was a couple. Phoenix, Phoenix Point was a little a little lumpy in places. Uh, but I liked it. I thought it did the, the XCOM thing well and did some interesting things with it. I absolutely love uh, Zen's pinball games. They are real good, like best best in class, uh, particularly the Star Wars pinball tables. <laughs> I was obsessed with the Empire Strikes Back pinball game that they made. It was really, really good. Um, yeah. Are they going to publish games 
under THQ Nordic, or I don't really know how that works. That, uh, that's what I'm guessing. Um, but uh, THQ Nordic have, I mean, they've some, they've really gone for that mid tier double A type of developer. Well, I, think, I think you have to when you're when you're that kind of mid level publisher. I don't mm-hmm. think you can kind of go in for the top. And, um, they've made some great stuff though. Desperado Three is that's still true. probably yeah. like it's probably one of my top three games of this year. Um, and they've uh, bought back some fun things as well, didn't they? They published a Darksiders. They did. Uh, whichever one that was, three. Uh, three. That was all right. Three. It was. It was all right. I think they've done. I think they've done some like. I think they've got some decent sevens, seven out of tens, and a couple of nine out of tens, and they're in a they're in a good place. Those uh, are good studios as well. And in their continued efforts to clean their house. Uh, Ubisoft has gotten rid of the managing director of Ubisoft Singapore, which was the studio working on Skull and Bones. Yes, do you remember Skull and Bones? Uh, this comes after the company performed a leadership audit following allegations of sexual harassment throughout Ubisoft. So still, uh, I suppose, making efforts to to clean their house, as I say. Uh, so Matthew, there are all your info snacks. A sour one to end on. <laughs> but it's okay because we're going but into it's something. Fantastic. We're, go- we're going into something that will make you very happy, I feel, as we look at some headlines and hot takes. So, headlines and hot takes is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where we we get in a little bit more deeper, a little bit more in depth on some of the bigger news stories in the past week. And one that I know delighted little Matthew Castle, if you'd like to give the people at home a rendition again. James Flippin' Bond is coming back to video games, all thanks to IO Interactive. So, what we kind of came out of nowhere as well. Project 007 is what IO are calling this, working title, obviously enough. Um, And this will be the first big Bond game since 007 Legends in 2012, which was published by Activision. Uh, The James Bond Twitter account tweeted on the day, Project 007 working title is a brand new James Bond video game with a wholly original story. Earn your 00 status in the very first uh, James Bond origin story to be developed and published by IO Interactive. IO studio boss Hacken Abrak said, It's true that once in a while the stars do align in our industry. Our passionate team is excited to unleash their creativity into the iconic James Bond universe and craft the most ambitious game in the history of our studio. So I was going to start off by asking if you were a James Bond fan, Matthew, but I have a feeling that that would be a complete waste of time. You've made it very, very clear. You like Bond, yes? I love James Bond. I love the James Bond films. I love some of the James Bond games. (laughs) I love the James Bond books. I actually wrote... Not, uh, I didn't do like a dissertation or anything at university, but I had to do a thing called an extended essay and I did it on James Bond adaptations. Um, yeah, I love, I love Bond a lot. Wow, I didn't realise you loved him that much. Yeah. Did, did, did you go so, so deep as into James Bond Jr.? Do you remember James Bond Jr.? Uh, that no, classic? That's not, not, not really my cup of tea. My favourite, my personal favourite. Well, I'm glad that you love Bond as much as you do because I've never really had an attachment to Bond. Uh, I don't, I, maybe that's because I've always found James Bond um, to be a little bit too English. Oh, for, here for, we go. For, here for, we no, go. no, 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 no. <laughs> but for me to kind of like appreciate. And also, right, when I was very young, uh, I don't know, was I... I must have been. It's cool though. But, right. Uh, and this is all, this is coming from a man who probably at the same time watched Face Off and thought that was brilliant. But I, it must have been one of the Roger Moore films. But 
there was a scene, I don't even know if this was in one of the films, but it feels like it would fit into a Roger Moore film. But on Sundays on RT, uh, the national broadcaster in Ireland, they would have something called the big, big movie. And they did loads, like a lot of the time they were James Bond films. So like kind of Sunday afternoon-ish. And I remember seeing one of the, one scene in a James Bond film where James Bond skied down some slopes into an aeroplane and then like parachuted out the back or something. Am I, did I imagine that or did that happen? The Union Jack on his parachute. Is, yeah, is that right? Is, is that so, I sort of. I think you're conflating a couple of things there, but yeah, roughly. Okay, and I saw that, and I was just like, "It's a bit silly, isn't it?" Yeah, but it's also cool. Mm, face off is cool. James Bond. Face off is, is violent. Face off is brilliant. There's but, also been an Irish Bond. Don't forget. Correct. I know you're not going to try to win me over. Look, like Bond is fine. He's he's whatever. People like him and more look to him. But I'm very excited about this. Like I always stab at James Bond because, and listen, I know many people have said this by now, but like if you could pick a developer to make a James Bond game, it would be them. You know, they have made a James Bond game. Hit hit Hitman one and two. They are James Bond games. They're like mean James Bond, but they actually tick the boxes perfectly. Like when I play Hitman, I'm often thinking, oh, this is like James Bond. It's why I like it. Because I think the, ma- the magic of James Bond is he isn't just an action hero. You know, he is a social spy. You know, he goes into mm-hmm. places, he infiltrates with charm and in a very relaxed way. He doesn't run around like an action man. He does when it all kicks off. And we'll get to that in a second. But I think the actual kind of the gameplay loop of James Bond, the character, is what a good Hitman level is. It's a space which has a public facing element to it where Bond is welcome. And his whole mission in every film, pretty much, is to break into the the murky layer that hides underneath it. And that's what mm. Hitman's always really been about, is is the kind of the 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 kind of dialogue between private and public spaces, not to be too pretentious about it. And that is what Bond's about. Also, uh, like the worlds Age of 47 occupies, I mean, throughout his games, but particularly in these last two, they are, you know, they're globetrotting, which is very Mm Bond-like. They're also quite elite places. You know, he gets to go into quite, you know, a part of the appeal of Bond is it takes us into you know, expensive glamour that we're, we're not normally invited into. You know, it's the Paris, I mean, the Paris level in Hitman 1 is as Bond as they come. Mm. You know, that, that could be a Bond set. And they've got the same, like, broad cinematic eye where I think they take, like, real places, recognisable things, and then Io kind of, like, they kind of emphasise the unrealness of them. Like, you know, everything rich and glamorous is as rich as glamorous as it can be and everything becomes extra sleek and kind of slightly unreal which i think is is also like key to bond it's kind of stuff you recognize but kind of blown out of proportion to a certain degree um they are such a good match for this it's Uh, just it's it's unbelievable that like things like this don't normally happen where someone who is so deserving of something actually gets to like do it it's great mm -hmm. I'm so excited. I'm genuinely like more excited about this than anything else in games. Good. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear Apart that from you're... maybe Breath of the Wild too. That's probably mm. any other thing. I'm glad that you, this is this has made you happy. But I have picked up on one or two things you've said, right? So you've, uh, you know, they've already made James Bond games, but James Bond and a bit meaner. I think that is something that is is important to note because the Hitman games, whilst they're predominantly about sneaking around and I suppose not being caught by your, um, by your enemies, like they can boil down into like killing and blood and guts and all that. Like, you, like when you're dealing with a licensed property, like James Bond, like who is, who is it? Is it Warner or M- I don't know, whoever owns James yeah, it's, Bond. It's, it's Warner, I think are publishing you, which I don't really know what the connection is. That's, you know, license wise, that's a bit but, baffling, but. But like whatever. when you're dealing with the James Bond license, like this isn't Agent 47 where you can do whatever the fuck you want with him. Like, do yeah. you, for, do you foresee a, 
Uh, and I'm not some sort of like, like blood, give me blood. Like, but do you think that they're going to have to tone down some of the... the, the I think they're going to have to... Nastiness? Yeah, m- may- maybe a little bit. I think the... Um, like, when you... The, the, the better you are at Hitman, or, and uh, Hitman's a very flexible thing, so better is, you know, a bit yeah. of a, a wonky phrase, but the more you aspire to the silent um, assassin ranking, which is like the ultimate ranking you can get, the closer you play the game as Bond, if that makes sense, Mm -hmm. because it's not about killing, it's about incapacitating, it's about hiding. If it all kicks off, you won't get silent assassin. It's going into a place to kill the very specific person you want to kill. Um, Admittedly, like the stuff he does is a lot more colourful than Bond. You know, Bond isn't really one for... um, you know, a, sticking like, on the chicken suit, or well, not? Yeah, that, that sort of slight silliness, but also he doesn't like kill from afar. You know, Bond's quite up close and personal. You know, it's mm. this. There's something quite kind of brutal about that. It's not about traps and sort of subterfuge. Um, but I think, I think one area where it may be. I think a a box, a Bond game probably does need to tick. And something that is true to Bond, but not Agent 47, is that there is a scale to Bond when the action kicks off. You know, Bond, for all that stuff I said, in every film, there is inevitably a bigger action set piece, which is more thrilling and out in the open. And you're shooting loads of henchmen. Often it's in like a big Bond base, you know, big baddie layer or whatever. And that is an area where, while there are, the action can kick off in Hitman, I don't think it's very good. I think that the game gets worse the more it moves away from being a purely stealth game. And I would say Mm. that is an area they need to, like, I think they need to be able to deliver on that. Like, I think just sneaking in and assassinating people, while suits Bond, I think you will also need to do the, the, there'll need to be a sense of of scale to some of that action and it'll need to handle as a better shooter. What I imagine, uh, like when they said they were doing this, while I think they could just basically rebrand a Hitman game as a Bond game and probably get away with it for the most part, I think Bond is more mainstream than Hitman. I think Hitman like is slightly arcane in some of its ideas. Like a lot of people who play Hitman now have just been fans of this series and have like learned some of its quirks and its weird rhythms um the more kind of sandboxy stuff i almost wonder if like bond will be that but a bit more mainstream like a little streamlined in places maybe punch up the action a little bit like i don't think it needs to be quite as nuanced a stealth game as hitman Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'd be interested, actually, if this is a bid for like, you know, they've got Hitman ticking that box for people who like those games. You don't just need to make another Hitman, but like this could be IO's attempt to maybe try and make something which is a bit more far reaching, you know, because I yeah, think yeah. if you took, you know, lots of, I mean, the cliche of like dads like Bond, but there are, you know, I can think of lots of people who like Bond who if I gave them Hitman, they would find it absolutely baffling, you know, as they're like rotating that inventory and going, oh, I've got a coin and I'll, Mm. flick this coin over here and do that isn't that that isn't very bond bond's a bit more chill than hitman in a way he just sort of gets on with it um so i i i'd be interested to see if they kind of take the best of hitman simplify it a bit add a bit more action um add a bit more of the kind of maybe if a few more mechanics that let you do the iconic stuff like will they have vehicles you know that's a very yeah. key that's a really yeah. key part of, of, of Bond, but I'm not saying I want them to make a linear action game. I may be a game which, which sort of has Hitman-like levels between more linear set piece stuff okay. so that it satisfies both. So a little hub world type of Yeah, or just areas. a story that, that opens up and then strips down for like certain pieces of getting, you know, so you can have like a car chase in between and that that's fine that doesn't that doesn't sit at odds but then when you get to your destination it opens up into more of a kind of a hitman sandbox um so like we we've said uh you know or you're you're talking about like what will they take from hitman 
Um, you know, what will they change from Hitman? Like, Hitman also is very silly, um, you know, and people love it for that reason because he's quite a stoic killer, essentially, Agent 47. But things can break can break down either through the physics in the world or, as I mentioned, you know, dressing up in a chicken suit mm. or a Santa costume or whatever else it is. What sort of bond do you see in this game? Because I mentioned earlier the Roger Moore era of the the double right. take <laughs> pigeon, the silliness of that, or the really gritty modern uh, Daniel Craig version. Like, I mean, wh- like, what type of bond do you think they're going to go for? I think, like, that. I think that as 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 much as the different bonds are very different, I actually think a lot of them are relatively interchangeable in terms of the worlds they occupy. Like, I actually think I think the Hitman like vision of how the world looks could work for many of the bonds. It's maybe a bit too hard edge for Roger Moore. I'd be surprised if they went for the Roger Moore thing. I mean, Bond feels like it's really exploded recently, specifically because of Daniel Craig's Bond. And people might have expectations of that kind of harder edged, um, slightly kind of tough. I mean, like the, just a Bond that fits the modern world a bit like more. The, the Jason Bourne Bond. That, that kind of thing, maybe with a bit more quipping. I mean, one thing that would be really interesting, like they've always done amazing like unlockables and a big part of Hitman is like replaying levels with new equipment you've unlocked to get a new take. What happens if you had like unlockable bonds? So you, you do it with their dream bond that they've crafted for their story, but then you can unlock the like, the you know, almost unlockable personalities. Mm. So then you can do the level again with like a Roger Moore quip master. And it's the same level, except it's got all this sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> he's constantly making all these jokes the whole time. Like they, they're a really playful studio and I'm sure they'll come up with an idea that is way better than that. But, you know, that's the kind of playful experimentation. I mean, I think, you know, one of the reasons I loved Goldeneye back in the day on the N64 was that like within those levels, you could express yourself in quite a few different ways. You felt mm-hmm. like you could play different bonds. You know, there were people who played them with the silenced pistols and you played it like a stealth shooter, but you could go all out and it was a very competent action experience. And I think, you know, people played Goldeneye a lot because of the multiplayer, but I played the single player over and over again. Like there were specific levels. I just love to replay and rerun. Like they just tick the boxes, the fantasies of what it was to be bond or like, I'm going to, just going to do it with throwing knives or whatever. And, I'd love to see that kind of come into come into play in in this bond. Because the the problem with basically every bond game between Goldeneye up until now is mm. they've just become more linear shooters. I mean, there was that Goldeneye remake where Activision yep. like infamously just basically turned it into a Call of Duty campaign where it was really scripted. It was all those classic Goldeneye locations, but you had to play it on their own terms, and it it was nowhere near as good a thing. It was also weird that they put Daniel Craig in it. Um, as Bond, even though it's Pierce Brosnan's Double Bond film, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I never but- really. I mean, that is one of the oddest retconning. I and mean, there's also, I saw this doing the rounds on Twitter again. The the the, the absolutely infamous Bond game that shit the bed was 007 Legends, which kind of took levels from the history of Bond, and you did them. But it was a game that was so wide mark, wide of the mark. There's a point in it where someone says, uh, you know, who are you or what's your name, and you turn to him and say. James Bond. <laughs> like, like, it literally failed at the first hurdle. Like, what's the most iconic thing about this character? Yeah, nah. James Bond, I'll have a beer. <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty rough. But they, like, I all have, f- well, uh, not complete freedom because they're dealing with a, a licensed property, but they still, by the sounds of it, have some freedom because... They're like, this is their own bond. This isn't attached to a film. This isn't attached to any actor. And this is also an origin story. So like, so I I suppose you would think an early, like a bond maybe in their twenties. I, to be honest, I, I don't know if there is any canon James Bond origin story. Like it seems like he was just came out of the womb with a martini, you know, like, like yeah. that. that, that yeah, it's, that's, it's weird. I mean, that's the one thing which actually gives me pause just because I think where the, the recent Bond films are weaker 
is where they try and like apply some okay. like psychological depth to Bond, like Skyfall. You know, they go back to his childhood home, and it's this idea there's some like great trauma in his past that sort of shaped him or whatever. And I don't know if I need that from my Bond particularly. Like I, I'm happy to, you know, for Bond to be this quite abstract secret agent man who just fits any adventure you put him in. Like I don't right. feel I need to. That that's quite a. That feels like quite a modern idea of of you know we have to understand everyone and everything is shades of gray and i don't necessarily need that but um i i hope that they don't get too bogged down in that i don't think they will like i said i just think they're too that they, they've got too much of a sense of humor they are too playful in their games um apart from the depressingly grim kane and lynch uh <laughs> to i hope it's the hitman magic they bring to this and not the gritty Kane and Lynch sort of depressive one. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I, know. I suppose, what, what, in an ideal world, what, what do you want then from, from this band? Like I said, well, like it's a, a hit, hit man that does the action better. Uh, some kind of structure that allows you to have uh some of the, the vehicles and the iconography mm. of, of Bond uh, that's bigger. I don't want them to lose that sense of um, like inter- infiltration, which I think is really key to Bond. So many Bond films, he just like puts on a, on a scientist coat and wanders into the secret lab. And as a child, I remember always thinking like, oh God, he's going to get caught. Like the idea, he was so brazen. Like he walks everywhere. He never runs around these bases. He doesn't hide behind boxes. He just sort of strolls with confidence. So everyone assumes he's meant to be there, which is like very Agent 47. Like I like that Agent Mm. 47's, even his run is like a bit of a jog. Like he isn't a man who exerts himself, which I think is, is very true to Bond. Um... Yeah, it's weird. It's almost like Hitman is such a naturally Bondy game that I that I wonder if they'll feel the need to differentiate it more so people don't just go, "Oh, you've just made Hitman again." And yeah. in differentiating it, they'll actually like you know they have to deny yes, themselves yeah. some easy wins in a way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I am I'm I'm really 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 excited about this. I mean, you know, I, a, a bit like when Larry and got Baldur's Gate it's just such a match for them you know mm-hmm. that, that when you see it and you're like oh yeah this is so this is a team that they don't make great games but to have that extra level of like um motivation on top you know something Larry and always talked about Baldur's Gate it's like you know we, we know how to make these these RPGs but you know the extra layer of we're making such a legendary thing like got the team excited in in a whole new way and really like brought out this like extra like a game or whatever and you know io have to love bond like it's just in their games like i i can't believe you know i don't believe for a second there's not anyone there who isn't like in love with this world and i think they're they're just going to do really awesome things with it and it's important it's it's not important it's it's dumb (laughs) but you know um bond has been like really mistreated by games and it's almost like because the films became classy again they almost like they've almost taken like firmer control of of the series again, and I don't think they just rush it out. You know, they made tie-ins of uh, Quantum of Solace. I think also had Casino Royale in it. Do you remember the Quantum of Solace game? Vaguely, vaguely. it wasn't very good, but I think that was the last Bond game, unless Double O Seven Legends came after that. But yeah, I, they haven't let anyone else like mess around with Bond too much. And I just hope that they, uh, you know, they want it to be classy. They want it to be good. As do oh. I. Matthew, I, I don't think I've ever heard you speak so passionately and lovingly <laughs> about any one thing. Well, it's because so. there's two great things coming together. That doesn't ever happen. You know, this like... Great books get adapted into films, but they're always given directors. You're like, oh, I don't really care for them or... It, nothing ever like clicks together like that. It's very rare, like that people get something so right. I and mean, of course, if it's shit, my disappointment will be. I mean, probably the greatest disappointment I've experienced in my life. 
So that's what Io have hanging over them. I mean, so you know, if you're listening, <laughs> I mean, the mad thing is, we've got like I don't know when this is due because we've got Hitman Three in mm-hmm. January, January, which is, yeah. I mean, oh god, that's gonna be amazing. I, you know, if that's anything like one and two, that's gonna be amazing. Uh, actually, or, yeah. What well, before uh, before we move on, uh, last question on Io and Bond. If Bond takes off massively. Do you, is there any fear or do you have any fear that Hitman will be left in the dust? Like as, as a series, like to be, I don't know, rebooted again in X amount of years? I mean, potentially. I mean, they've. it feels like three is not a natural conclusion. They've been telling a story across one and two. Um, not one that I care for a huge amount. But. Uh, okay, okay. I have a follow-up question after you finish that thought. <laughs> um, but. Uh, you know, it felt like they're coming to the end of this, like, connected, was it World of Assassination, they call yeah. it? Um, so maybe this is just the natural, like, breather in between things. I mean, I don't know. I just feel like they've really nailed the Hitman formula, like, you know, unless they just keep adding locations, which would probably be a bit thankless after a while. Fair, uh, fair point. You know, uh, a, 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 change of, a change of pace is surely welcome and deserved. So you brought up a point that I forgot to mention a second ago, because uh, I agree. The story of Hitman is, I mean, it's not great, Matthew. Uh, <laughs> like, and I know many people, and I agree with them to a point, many people would say, but that's not what you come to Hitman for. It's for the the emergent gameplay, the world, yeah. the, the blah, 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 blah. And it's like, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. But then I'll follow that up with, but imagine how great Hitman would be or greater if this, like, if it had an incredible story attached or even a good story attached. <laughs> like, uh, and you know, James Bond is, you, you're going to have to have a good story with that, surely. It can't just be I mean, cool. The, the Bond stories are pretty broad. I'm really, they're just expositionary excuses to get Bond around the world. I mean, and yeah. in close contact with stuff. I think something that they could really benefit from as an overarching story is like a proper big villain, which is essential mm. to Bond. I mean, that's the thing. Like he won't just be killing the big villain in level one because that, you know, the, the problem with Hitman is that actually the, the stories within the levels are great. You know, mm-hmm. they are little sandboxes that you have to explore over and over again to just learn. And you learn about your targets through that. You basically learn the little side stories of everyone involved. Um, it's it's just then the structure, which is really the cutscene between levels, which is a bit lacking. But I don't think they're bad storytellers. I think they tell good, good location-based stories. Yeah. Um, I think Bond definitely needs a stronger, like, more compelling or just like clearer story like the hitman story is kind of sub bondy anyway um uh so it feels like they're leaning that way but it's also bogged down with like hitman lore which i'm really not interested in you know hitman himself i mean that's the other big difference is that agent 47 himself is so so dry and unknowable you know, it's just and not, but not a bad performance. The guy plays him well to what yep. he's, you know, how he's written. But that with a more charismatic, funnier lead, I think that that can make all the difference. Oh, I'm really excited about a big Bond villain now. Mm. The last level going into like a huge volcano base. I hope that they go like properly Bond silly right at the end. You know, like just at the end, he's got a base inside an iceberg or something. You know, I really want, I, I like. A base inside a thing is that is you that's, know classic that's, Bond. That's Bond. Um, so yeah, uh, like yeah, all, all we have is a teaser trailer at the minute. So, yeah, oh my, uh, and, bullet in a gun. <laughs> uh, yeah, and our imagination to go on. So we'll see. We're um, uh, we're, we're probably going to have to wait a while for more news on that. But yeah, yeah. we'll we'll see where uh, I suppose what we get from that next. Um, and if it's a good game, if it's a great game, if it's one of the best games, then my boy, Jeff Keighley, will probably recognise it at the Game Awards. Um, but not at the Game Awards 2020, because it's not out yet. Um, it's not in consideration. Bless you, Matthew. Um, Thank you. So, uh, during the week... 
Jeff Keighley did announce the nominees for the Game Awards 2020. And uh, yeah, the, the actual award show is happening on the 10th of December, obviously because of social distancing and all that. It's not going to have your big crowd, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if you're unaware, right, um, the nominees for the Game Awards are selected by, quote, an international jury of over 95 global media and influencer outlets. Uh, then whomever, I doubt Jeff himself, but maybe, uh, they go through all the all the votes and the winners are decided um, 90% on the actual jury and 10% on the fans because you yourself at home, if you want to vote on this, you can go to thegameawards.com. You can vote on it, blah, blah, blah. The, uh, the Game Award, the Game of the Year Award uh, has six nominees and they are as follows. Animal Crossing New Horizons, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Ghost of Tsushima, uh, The Last of Us 2 and two games only, or only two games available on PC, Doom Eternal and Hades. Now, Matthew, I'm not going to ask you what game you think should win the game of the year. I'm not going to ask you anything about the best art direction, the best sound, the best (laughs) indie, whether indie should even be a category anymore, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to ask you, what audience is the Game Awards serving? Because I feel like video games as a medium is forever wanting their Oscars, their Emmys, their Grammys, their et cetera, et cetera. But the Game Awards has been, like it's been made quite clear that the Game Awards, uh, even when it became the Game Awards post VGAs, when it was involved in Spike, um, and it was a bit more sort of MTV movie awards when it became the game awards it was like, Oh, is it going to be more prestigious or whatever? It's like, and I'm not taking away anything from the people who get the awards. Well done. You're all brilliant, et cetera, et cetera. But the actual, like the event itself, it's just trailer after trailer after trailer. And that's kind of, oh, it's, 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 it's an event. It's an award ceremony designed to, to look to look trailers. forward to, to yeah, design to look forward not look back that's the weirdest thing it's it's advertised on the appeal of it is pretty much entirely what's going to happen i've always had this problem with um jeff Keighley's stuff is that he just he's like addicted to the future and the second games come out do you ever hear him say anything <laughs> about a game that he's played in the past or what's happened he's just obsessed with the next thing the next thing the next thing he's like the he, for me He's like the worst of gaming habits. He's just a pure hype beast. And his award ceremonies, that's all they exist. Like to the point where you go to the, you know, you watch them and it's like, oh, here are a load of awards that we're not going to show, but here's who won them. Like they don't even care enough to announce all the awards there. So remember there's that famous year where they did like voice actor had like happened off stage and it just cut to like, Mark Hamill kind of shrugging at like, why the fuck am I here? And that's kind of how I feel about it. It's like, it's just, not, you know, it's it's just trying to create another promotional beat, like a weird E3 conference, like mm. everything he does. And I know it's hard work and I know some people love it. I'm not trying to knock him, but like, it's, I just, I literally couldn't give a fuck about his awards. And he tries to give them legitimacy by having critics nominate them. But like the panel is always a little strange. And it's, I mean, it's so stacked with PlayStation stuff. Like PC is so underrepresented. I don't think they have, their their panel is is uh, very diverse at all in terms of I mean, uh, platform. Like, in ter- yeah, and just on the simple grounds of platform diversity, um, mm-hmm. this to me smacks of you know. Anecdotally, most people play on a PlayStation. Lo and behold, it's mostly PlayStation nominations. I mean, Ghost of Tsushima is. So far from being a best game of the year for me, I so far from it. I have no That's idea. That's what, what I've doing heard from this. anyone who's played it, which it's is why like, I find it very it's odd. Mad. It's, it's mad that that's on there. I mean, but that's 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 what they want you to do, isn't it? Get yeah. like, ah, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. No, I, I, think, I will uh, say. I will say I don't have any issue with Jeff Keighley because he doesn't present himself as a games journal. He's not a journalist. He's not. He is a presenter, and he's quite accomplished at it. And more look to him in that regards. 
Like oh, the, yeah, man, I, the, I, the, I the man himself. Like, yeah, but, I, but, I know it's a huge amount of work and he gets people, you know, he gets huge people to come together and that's really impressive. I mean, no one else can do that. But, but I, I, I do find the Game Awards an odd beast because, uh, yeah, it is a, uh, you know, E3 is in June, so we're going to have something in December. To break it's basically six months later and then six months again we'll be back at E3. So it's constantly ticking over. Like um, off the top of my head, Skyrim was announced at the Game Awards. I think one of the Batman, Arkham, like you do get like big game announcements. I'm fully sure that we'll get big announcements at this one and we'll come on the following week on the week spot and we're going to talk about them. Mm. But uh, I don't know, I don't know. I, maybe it's because... In some way, I'd quite like games to have their Oscars as well, because I do like a a, a, an, a yearly award show that says, you know, this game was good or whatever, whatever, this album was good, this play was good, this film was good. Like, and I would love that for games as well on a larger scale. Some people will say, well, that's what the BAFTAs are. That's what uh, the awards of the GDC at GDC are. Um but it it feels like, you know, the biggest one with the most reach is the Game Awards, yet it does go down this hype route forever. Always, what's coming out? What's, you know, what are you going to be playing? It's, As you it's, said, it's, not, it's, not saying like, God, that game that we played was very good, wasn't it? Unless he's totally thrown out the rule book for this one and this is and going to be that. I also, I, don't know. I, know, I know that, like, I hope this doesn't sound snobby. I know that it's publicly voted and that's used as like a mark of honesty that it's, you know, these are the real people who play these games, who make these decisions. But I just don't feel, it just turns it into a simple popularity contest and that it just sucks. It's like, which of you has got the biggest, you know, Twitter community Mm -hmm. that you can like bombard the voting with and, It'll always be PlayStation just because the install base is so big. You know, I much prefer, you know, the BAFTAs. The Academy having a a sort of... The way the BAFTA games work is they have a panel for each game with people who are considered relevant to that panel. So on, like, Mm. the best performance, they'll actually have actors from BAFTA come in and part of the conditions of being on that panel is that you experience all the games like I, not, I just don't see how you can have six games and say this is the best of these six if you haven't played them all. Like that, that simply isn't fair. I, I was on the BAFTA panel one year. Even that, like even on this, which on, on that panel, which I thought, like at least gave you the best shot at like an honest answer. You know, there were people on the panel who were like, yeah, I played it for two minutes, didn't understand it, and you were like, were well, you really, you know? I, I personally found it like, well, I, I gave all these games an equal amount of time. Mm-hmm that's kind of like offensive and I imagine your peers would be quite disturbed to hear allegedly, you know, key industry figures being so dismissive of their work, um, which deserves an equal shot. And, you know, and, <laughs> and on that, two minutes. On, yeah, I, honestly, I was on this, this panel and the game that the game that almost <laughs> won was literally like, uh, the easiest game to like the easiest game to play. It was like an interactive movie game. Mm-hmm. And that was the one that these people, and then there was some, there was some like management and strategy games and like half the panel were like, nah, turn it on. Didn't even get through the tutorial. And it's like, great. So you just like the game, you pressed X to make a cutscene happen. You know, is this really fair? You know, are you really being judged by, by a panel of your peers here? But at least that was closer. At least there was the illusion mm. of, 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 of everyone having played something. And you felt like, you know, there was a discussion. It was like a three-hour discussion in that room. It was pretty serious business. 12 um, Angry Men style. It was very style. like 12 Angry Men, except instead of trying to convince everyone that uh, the guy was innocent, you're trying to convince everyone that fucking Batman Arkham Knight is like the best game of the year. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, so why do you think... Do you think there is a market for a, a mass market... Uh, video game Oscars and I'm not even saying like on the level of the Oscars I'm saying a a prestige event a black tie as you yourself wear every week you know so you would fit right in but like yes a black tie really kind of fancy nice 
big stage show when we're not social yeah, distancing. Yeah, but it arguably has those, you know, because there of the are awards and, you know, that are yeah. peer nominated and voted for. They just no one's really interested in them because they are simply awards. You know, as much as people talk about we want like the legitimacy, you know, it legitimizes our industry to have awards that are like the Oscars. Gamers don't actually give a fuck about any of that. What they actually want is trailers from Jeff Keighley. Like they don't care yep. about the awards. It means nothing. It probably means a lot to the people who win them, and it's nice. But yep. I don't know. I find game awards generally like a pretty shaky thing. I mean, film awards are too. I'm not saying you know they're 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 equally busted. You know, like I, challenging I, 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 challenging work will be ignored I, in I all think, the awards. But I th- I think that say. I don't know, uh, pick a film outlet, whatever, Empire. Like if Empire do their like end of year film awards, like I'm sure, you know, they're going to take a very, as anyone would take it very seriously and so on and so forth, right? Um, but the the difference between, say, in video games where Rock, Paper, Shotgun will have their end of year, uh, IGN, GameSpot, Eurogamer, what, blah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Every outlet is going to have their year end awards and decide on the best game of the year. But if you have that in film as well, like, uh, I suppose, what am I trying to say? Like, you know, the Oscars has been around since the dawn of time. So like some of these outlets that are choosing their game of the year have actually been around longer than the game awards, the like number one yeah. biggest. So I think that's probably why something like the the, the, the Grammys, the Emmys, the Oscars, da, 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 like they ha- they hold more weight than... Yeah, I mean, I, I think with all these things, you just find... You find a, a group of people who you're roughly aligned with or who speak to you and you connect with their opinions more often than not. And if they choose to do an end of year roundup, which most people do, then you can read something into that. If you feel that affinity for any particular award show, um, lucky you. I don't see how you can. You know, I don't see you can be like, yeah, I make my choices based on this. I mean, it seems madness to me. Like they're so kind of... Uh, skewed by various factors um i'm not saying like necessarily that's rps for you it might be for some people uh you know i always love doing the end of year videos because i you know on, on the channel we always used to do each member of the team picks four or five games and we just smash them all together no particular order it's just like here are some recommendations of things we enjoyed this year and that to me feels like a a very healthy way of talking about this games are too it's just too many of them and they're too diverse in their styles to kind of make them compete in arbitrary ways. Uh-huh. Whereas I'm the opposite. I love an arbitrary competition. I'm like, you know, fucking push, put this game up against this game. You know, they're totally different. It's like, yeah, but which one is best? It's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's easy to do with certain disciplines, maybe, you know, best like shooter, best blah, 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 and, blah. Well, it's just, I think the things where you can go, like there probably is a, you know, like, well, like sound edit, like disciplines of game making, you know, like this mm. sound editing is phenomenal or special in a particular way because, you know, da 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 da. Um, but the idea of like, what's better, Animal Crossing or Desperados 3? I mean, fucking what? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure you would say Desperados 3, obviously. So, you yeah. know, there you go. You've answered the question. Desperados 3 is one of the few like PC games in the game awards i think it's up for best strategy or whatever go and what vote you, for what that do you mean, what do you mean well, it's on it's on consoles as well but it feels like it belongs on pc i'd say desperate is this desperate yeah, Desper- is, on- is on console yeah did not know that I d- yeah yeah but well, that's it you know it feels like a pc game mm. and that's a great they are a great studio and they deserve exposure and maybe they get mega exposure from this i don't know maybe like maybe developers actually love the video game awards because just that nomination exposes them to an audience. Yeah. But I have a feeling that most people skip the categories that they don't know any of the games in and, and just go, uh, where, where are all the nominations for The Last of Us? So I can click on that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. but you know, that's all right. People, people are simple and they like simple things. I get it. <laughs> um, so and yeah. Maybe you can see look. Crash Bandicoot. With a fucking face mask on again. Oh, yeah, that's what I want. Um, but yeah, I look forward to the episode following the the Game Awards where we're going to be talking about it in depth and going, wow, Jeff Keighley, really terrific show this year. Um, I want to know which character in video games is like an anti-masker. 
I want Ooh. them to have like Crash Bandicoot in a mask, Mario in a mask, and then there's Spyro's like, I think it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great opening skit. Oh, that would be, yeah, would really... Um... And then just throughout the show, Spyro gets like more and more out of sorts and then is dead at the end. Oh, what a message be... that would send. And, if, and I mean, then it's like, that was the message of the Game Awards. Wear a fucking mask or you'll be... die like Spyro. I, I, and I think, you know, you could sacrifice Spyro as well. Sacrif- uh, Spyro is known enough that people will listen or rec- see what's happening <laughs> to Spyro. And then also he's, you know, Spyro in the big scheme of things. Pff, yeah. Whatever. Like you, you can kill off Spyro. So I think that's actually not a bad idea. So maybe that's, maybe that's what he has planned. He's going to kill off Spyro. Fingers crossed. Um, also in other video game news, something that hasn't been killed off just yet, because it's not alive yet, I suppose. It's not alive until the 10th of December is Cyberpunk 2077. We got our presumably final uh, Night City Wire before launch, unless it gets delayed, which who knows at this rate, but let's just say that it is coming out on the 10th of December because that's what they told us. Uh, And in this final Night City Wire, Uh, We got a lot on Johnny Silverhand and Keanu Reeves' role, uh, or sorry, Keanu Reeves' performance of the role, so I'm in the little, wearing the little ball suit and talking about how fucking he was loving life and all that. Uh, But uh, (laughs) there was an interesting part in it where Boris Pugax, shit, I'm going to try Matthew, Boris Pugax Morascuet, I I really apologise, Boris, if you're watching. Um, But he is the English adaptation director. And during the the show, he said that the team actually considered actors and other, other actual rock stars for the role of Johnny Silverhand before deciding upon Keanu Reeves. And he also said, quote, at one point, we even toyed with the idea of taking and reviving a recently deceased longtime luminary of the recording industry. So my question to you, Matthew, is who the fuck is that? And (laughs) is it David Bowie? Because it probably is, isn't it? I feel like that that's the, like, who, who's the dead rock star that they're going to, they're going to revive for this? Prince? Could be Prince. Probably <laughs> not. Probably not Michael Jackson. Um, no. I, yeah, I, but I, I, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I had, I had no ideas for this, but actually, but Bowie or Prince, Bowie particularly would fit this world of like, you know, all identities can constantly shift and, uh, mm. you know. Um, I mean, I'm glad they didn't go down that route because that would be crass in the extreme. Um, also, show so, yeah. me the, show me the estate that is happy for their deceased asset slash loved one to be asset. <laughs> to be used in that way. <laughs> I mean, I'd be very very surprised. I was I, like, I it's mean, like when some they brought probably that guy would back be in Star Wars. I thought that was creepy as fuck as well. Um, uh, it, pushing it, that that's kind of we live in this era now where. You can do that. Like the other night. Yeah, that, is, that is black mirror bullshit. Oh, I mean, and it maybe, totally is. Yeah. It would actually suit cyberpunk, you know, it being about like the grotesque excesses of tech to actually have a demonstration of that power at its heart would actually be thematically brilliant. <laughs> if they had like <laughs> play, uh, and playing the role of Johnny Silverhand, it's Des O'Connor. And you're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, well, like that. Yeah, I got quite excited about this recent footage. I think it's looking pretty good. It is looking pretty good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, it seemed to have a bit of... I don't know if they Like, it feels like they're talking about the story a bit more, and you're, I was like, oh, okay, I'm actually up for this, and how it all kind of holds together. Um, I mean, it is... Uh, yeah, I feel like we've... Like, you know, there's very little more that can be said about Cyberpunk 2077 uh, even after for years and years and years saying nothing, you know, in recent months, it's just been overload of information on it. So yeah. like, I've kind of gone into lockdown a little bit with it, you know, mm. like I've been avoiding the, the big previews of it and things because, you know, I just want to go into that and, and, and sort of see it for myself, experience it for myself. Um, but with the Witcher three, they were very, um, 
even with that, like what they actually talked about and showed of the whole game was like absolutely nothing. So I have, I have mm. faith that they've kind of kept this. I actually, in the last Night Wire as well, a thing I thought was uh, really impressive was the um, demo of the lip, lip syncing tech. Did you see that? That was very impressive, yeah. Like so the for those idea that, that they could that just match it to the language. Yeah. Mad, yeah. For those that didn't see, uh, this company, oh, it was four letters. I can't remember the name of them, but it was- Jolly. Uh, yes, it was, wasn't it? I think so. Mm. Um, they showed how, yeah, it was, it was some witchcraft where like you, yeah, you could get the characters to match the uh, the language of whatever language track is playing. It was, there was, they showed off Russian, French, and like the lip syncing was perfect. I'd imagine incredibly expensive and, you know, yeah, not every know video that's... game is going to be able to do it. I don't know if they were implying that that was going to happen in real time. Like if you set it to different languages it would adapt to those languages or if that's the tech they've used just to make the localized version of that. I don't know if you like, Perhaps. if you download the French version of the game, it's got those lip things baked in rather than like, if we get the version and then we change it to Japanese, will it match? But it was, mm. it was pretty convincing. Um, yeah. I love the, I think the facial stuff in general, like that being, you know, and it was, it was great in the Witcher three. I thought they were, they were like, especially, emotive as actors but in that first person perspective i think there's going to be some pretty pretty staggering stuff in there i'm actually mm. getting quite pumped for this now um, yeah yeah but yeah no it will, will, it's um, happening soon it's only a couple of weeks away it, it is yeah two weeks is it over two that's three weeks great that's gonna be a great christmas holidays game isn't it mm, yeah big time big time so uh yeah i don't know unless anything happens in the world of cyberpunk unless there's another delay um, probably the next time we'll be talking about it, I'd imagine, will be, be when it comes out. out. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so that's good. Uh, and finally, oh, 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 what's that coming up? It's a right angle. Oh, it's time oh, for no. Tech Corner, boys and girls. Uh, because, um, so NVIDIA's 30 series graphics cards, uh, they've been hard to come by. Um, and uh, NVIDIA CFO, Colette Cress, she said, yes, we are aware of this and we're not happy. She said, quote, uh, this was during a, a, an earnings call. She said, quote, uh, given industry-wide capacity constraints and long cycle times, it may take a few more months for product availability to catch up with demand. So my question to you, Matthew Castle, is what is the best thing that you had to wait for? Oh. <laughs> what in any category in life um i'm currently waiting for a book to come out in 2021 and i read the first book two years ago and it ended on a cliffhanger um i've been waiting for that it's a chinese thriller uh the first book was called death notice uh the second one is called it may be called Death Notice something else, but... It's, was it? De- not I'll Death go- Note. Maybe that's what I'm mixing it up that's, with. That's, yeah, the, yeah. that's the manga anime thing. Maybe, yeah. Uh, it, it's a really good thriller, Death Notice, but I read it and it got to the end. And then at the time, there was like no evidence that they were even going to translate the next books. It's You know, they've been out in China for a while. Um, but yeah, the next one comes out in 2021. So... I don't know, three years maybe isn't that long waiting for something, but when you're excited for it, and the book had real momentum, so like you get to the end and you're like, and? Very good you? cliffhanger. Um, I think I've waited the longest for, um, uh, I mean, I'm quite hungry at the minute. So, don't tell me. Uh, Today's lunch is the thing. You've waited for two hours for it. That's all you, know, you have to and do. I, I'm going to have to wait for another, like, 40, 50 minutes or so. Like, so that's it's probably that, really. My, tummy, my tummy's grumbling, Matthew. Show and tell, show and tell. We can't afford a proper jingle. Jingle. It's meant to be jingle. Yes, show and tell is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where we discuss the video games we've been playing over the last seven days or this week. 
it's, it's loose, really, when we say the video games <laughs> that we've been playing over the last seven days. Because, and look, we're going to tie this in. Don't you worry, your pretty little head. Matthew Castle, you have been playing the PlayStation 5. Yes. Um, and the reason we're bringing this up is because, uh, well, there was a couple of stories ran by websites about um, Steam getting updated uh, or the dual sense, the new the PlayStation Five controller, um, updating drivers, whatever you can use the dual sense now with the PC, uh, but you can't use the adaptive triggers yet. Is what most people are saying, which makes me think, huh, interesting. Maybe you will eventually be able to use the adaptive tri- triggers because I believe that is the thing. That is the uh, the real selling point of the PlayStation Five. These. Yeah, these these triggers. Well, yeah, the controller is a box of tricks. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. Um, yeah, it has uh, like quite a nuanced rumble. Um, I don't really know what the correct term for it is, but they can, it, it like directionally, it can it can do some interesting stuff. And it, it HD can, um, rumble, HD rumble, they're calling it, um, which I think is is almost as cool as the adaptive triggers. Um, but uh, yeah, the adaptive triggers are like your L2 and your R2, which are the big ones on the back. I should have had the controller here to hand. Sorry. Um, <laughs> they um, they basically can apply a lot of resistance to them mm-hmm. so that if the motion you're doing is meant to be a bit stiffer, the, the trigger can be very loose. It can be very stiff. It can like lock halfway down or it can like partially lock and you have to like push through it. So it starts off with you squeezing it and then you almost feel like, they've reached their biting point, but then you kind of push through it and then these like fire comes out the bottom of the control on the screen. It's, it's very impressive, actually. Like I, I didn't realize they were going to have the resistance they do. Um, but really what this is, I mean, this, the, the little game playing is called Astro's Playroom, which is like a, a pack-in game on PlayStation 5, again, not on PC, um, to show it off. But what this does demonstrate is this, this was a game made to show off this technology and... Um, it shows it off better than anything else that I've played on PS5. Like you have to actually, you know, not go some, but you, you do have to like incorporate the, the, the use. It's not like it's naturally magicked up out of any game. Like you have to mm. design your game with this controller in mind, which is why, while it's great that Steam has quickly adapted to put the drivers out for, for this, so this controller will work sort of seamlessly and its functions can be used. It doesn't mean those functions aren't naturally in the game. You know, people would have to patch them into their yeah. PC games to work, which... Well, well I, that's why I was going to ask you if, like, do you think that... Do you think that developers will actually use the uh, I don't the really know what the rules are around this, because surely if this controller and its functionality is built for PlayStation, surely Sony aren't going to be happy if developers are taking their... Yeah. APIs or whatever to, to make to make these things work on PC games because it's a unique selling point is to encourage you to buy it. You know, if if it was like that, if Sony were trying to encourage you to buy the dual sense as a PC controller, I could see a version where like if Ubisoft say put um you know adaptive triggers and rumble into their multi format games. Why not incorporate it on PC? But I just, I, I, it, the, none of these stories seem to go into like what the actual rules are around that. You know, yeah. just to me, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like something that if I was Sony, I, I wouldn't want my very unique thing just to be given away to, to anyone. Um, I obviously it, hope that it will. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but I get what you're saying. Like, cause I believe um, Black Ops Cold War uses the the adaptive triggers and all that as well on on PlayStation. So I, I I get what you're saying. Like if you want to buy that on PC, but you want the fancy uh, resistance in your triggers and all that, and you're able to get that on yeah, the PC. I mean, use, the, yeah, their yeah. argument is we made that for PlayStation 5, right? But well, mm-hmm. I say that's their argument. That That's what I would imagine, imagine their argument yeah. is. Like we haven't heard them make, make the point. Um, it's a good controller though. It's it's very comfortable to hold. Um, the amount of functionality in it is is neat. I mean, with all these things, it's just a case of whether or not anyone does them. And, you know, I must admit, like going from this, which is a real showcase for it, this zip is really nice on the touchpad. It the, the combination of the 
touchpad, the rumble, the noise coming out of the speaker, it's very zip-like. Um, Good to hear. <laughs> and this ball you control by tracing a path on the trackpad. Right, um, okay. Things like that. Um, but I can't, see a, I can't see a version of events where anyone's allowed to use this. Like, they've designed this for their audience, surely. Um, though mm-hmm. I hope it comes. I like gimmickry. But so anyway, the point I was actually going to make was that while this demo shows off this stuff really well, like just shifting to something like Spider-Man on PS5, I actually found the, the use of the pad quite underwhelming. Like oh, the adapt- interesting. The, the adaptive triggers didn't really... Like there's a bit of tension when you're web swinging and there's a bit of rumble. Like when you're on the underground train, there's like a clack, 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 clack of the cars and everything, which is kind of neat. But, you know, all that in a lot of the promotional materials, they're like, you're going to feel the electricity of your attacks like fizzle around the pad. And it just sort of feels like a pad rumbling. Um, mm. And I would, I would have thought the first party games were surely going to be the best showcase for the pad. You would imagine, yeah. So for it to be a little underwhelming like that, I, I don't know. But, you know, I, I, coming from a Nintendo background where it's you get a lot of gimmicky controllers, um, this stuff dies off pretty quickly. Like, you'll maybe get, like, 10 games per platform that could only exist with this controller. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice thing, though. It's a, you know, if you get a chance to try a PS5 and try this demo, there's some really cool stuff in it. There's bits where it's raining and it does feel like the pitter patter of rain on the pads. Interesting. Um, like, do, do, you think it would, do you think it would, if, uh, I don't know, if everyone played nice and PlayStation, you know, with the, the uh, Horizon and Death Stranding and them saying that like more games are going to be coming to PC and if they played nice with Valve, et cetera, et cetera. Like, uh, do you think it would... Would people benefit greatly from this on PC? Like, w- would it actually, like, do you think it's it's a proper game changer, the dual sense? Uh, yeah, if, 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 it got, if it got used properly and, and they were open to, you know, PS5 developments working on PC where they choose to bring those games to PC, it's certainly a cool thing. I'm into it. I love, like I say, I, I like, you know, gimmicky controllers done well. I, I am a mm. fan. Some people like that. There, there is something very nice and simple about the Xbox pad. And I know a lot of people who do use a controller for PC, or if they buy a separate controller, they'll probably buy an Xbox pad just because they're familiar with it. You know, it feels like the standard pad for PC yeah. still. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, you know, a cool thing. Well, what have you been? Even t- t- talking about. Uh, the Xbox controller, just controllers on PC. Uh, there was some, I believe, in some story I saw in the last week. It was, is it 50%? I well, no, be- in this, thing, I think it was in the Steam story themselves. They were like, where games suit or fit controllers neatly or whatever, like they sometimes see like six up to 60% of people using a controller rather than mouse That's keyboard. Right, yeah. I mean, we get a lot of snob. We always got a lot of uh, grief about this on our videos where I was using a pad, but. I've got a PC set up in the living room and I don't always want to faff, faff around with a mouse and keyboard. Um, I find pads. I mean, the thing is, if the pad gets you through the game, then it doesn't need a mouse and keyboard. You know, like, there are very few games which I can't play with a, with a control pad. Like, you know, they may be improved. Like, they, may be, they may be, like, improved with a mouse and keyboard, but they don't necessarily need... They don't need it. I mean, they just mm-hmm. don't, you know... But which is which is the big difference. So I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, Whatever makes you happy. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a video game that I played in the last week using a controller on the PC uh, is The Pathless, which is uh, a new game from the developer of Abzu, Giant Squid. Um, it is, uh, so how the pathless works is, uh, you play as the hunter, who is this woman who's really good at using a bow and arrow and they must use their bow and arrow to lift a curse that's on, that's enveloped in this island and it's turned four large creatures into evil red creatures. It's pretty simple enough. But this selling point of the pathless really is, uh, it's movement. Um, so you get around this grassy, although there are other 
areas as well. Uh, but this uh, large open world environment by shooting your bow and arrow at these glowy diamonds that are scattered around the place. And when you land a shot on one of these, your mm. stamina meter, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, that starts to fill up. Um, and uh, there are other glowy diamonds around as well. Uh, later on in the game, there's one that gives you altitude. But the idea basically is to never let that stamina meter deplete. And it does go down pretty quickly. So right. the idea is to constantly keep that topped up by always shooting the... Um, always shooting the diamonds and always dashing. And brilliantly, like the, when this works, it works brilliantly and it works quite often as well because you don't have to aim. Your bow actually locks onto the nearest diamond. So all you have to do is either on the controller or the keyboard is hold down the button mm. uh, before releasing it and then you're completely golden. As long as there isn't one or two times uh, there was a tree in the way and I got caught by that but you know as long as that, that's fine so your character actually feels sort of like a like you're a car in a ra- in a driving game or something right because you're you're making these um these wide sweeping turns rather than precise movements you know and, and right. on top of that the fact that you're you're always moving or nine times out of ten you should always be moving do you die if you run out of stamina uh no you don't. You just go very slowly, basically. Right. Um, but there, there are power points of the game where uh, precision is necessary, and your speed must slow down. You benefit from a slower speed because there are puzzle uh, uh, sections. Right. Um, but the, the, you're m- more often than not you're kind of exploring. But is yeah, there, this, is there more aerial movement? A lot of this seems like you're just sort of running along the ground a lot. Yes, there are. So you have a little bird, a little Mm. eagle fella, uh, that's able to, well, one, you're able to use them to glide uh, from uh, one area to to the next. But Mm. they also have a flap, so they're able to give you more more altitude. And you can collect these glowy little, uh, you can upgrade your eagle, basically, uh, so that they can give you extra flaps to give you more more altitude. but yeah, there there is there is an aerial aspect to it as well. It's just the 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 footage that you're seeing and the viewer is seeing is from the the earlier game section. But mm. as well as the the movement and the puzzles, you also have boss battles from the these creatures that are now evil that I mentioned. Um, and they they sort of they're split up into different sections. So you have a chase sequence, which involves you, as I said, constantly keeping that stamina meter topped up and just uh, dashing around this large area. But also there will be a, a sort of a puzzle-like battle as well, where they'll have diamonds on their body that you must shoot, essentially. Mm. Um, but one of the bigger parts of this that I suppose I haven't mentioned, it's called the Pathless, so you don't have a map. Right. The way you get around this world is by using your detective vision mode thing. Right. Are you having a, are you having a Rennie? Are you okay? Yes, I'm having a Rennie. <laughs> Good. Get, 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 get that down, yeah? Um, but the way to get around this world is by using the detective mode vision thing, mm. uh, which will show uh, areas of interest that you haven't completed yet. There'll be like a red cloud around them. And sometimes... Like not having the map is okay most of the time, but uh, sometimes these uh, red clouded areas can seem closer than they are. And, you know, because it has that Skyrim Zelda E, if you can see it, you can go to it. But sometimes the map or the not having a map will leave out the fact that there's a, a huge ravine between you and the fucking landmark that you have to go to. Right, right. Um, but. So yeah, like I said, like you know, it's path, like lack of a map, pathless, explore. Uh, but the problem is, right? Whilst that is enjoyable for a while, this is a bit longer than say I mentioned that this is the same developer who did Abzu. So Abzu is your mileage may vary. A lot of people really liked it. I didn't, but I do really like that type of game, uh, mm. and they often work because they're a bit shorter. Like the pathless is probably I don't know depending on 
depending on if, because there are collectibles and all that. So depending on if you really buy into all that, eight hours, maybe. Oh, okay, right. So, and, and because of that, and given its aimlessness and its bare bones story, uh, uh, that I haven't really gone into, but like, you know, it's, it's totally bare bones and I don't know, it doesn't really give you much reason to properly care about the world. Right, um, right. But it can get repetitive and thus boring. <laughs> um, but like in saying that, it is still, uh, like as you can see, it's very pretty and it's mm. the the getting around the world, going from A to B is really enjoyable when it works, when it's all kind of, when it's firing in all cylinders. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's an enjoyable I might, yeah, game. I might, I might give this one a go. I've, I've you know, it's sort of semi caught my eye. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very pleasant. It's very uh, pleasant. It, well, yeah. That's what we want in these unpleasant times. Well, that that was actually my thinking. Like I was like, oh fucking, the world is shit. Let's play a nice game, and that's that's what this is. It's quite quite a nice video game. Yes, Mystery Steam Reviews is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where I, Colin Mahern, and he, Matthew Castle, test the knowledge of one another via Steam Reviews. It's quite simple, but let me explain if you're new here. The rules are as follows. Uh, both I and Matthew bring three Steam Reviews to the MSR Arena, but we omit the name of the game associated with each review. Our opponent must correctly guess the game attached to each review. One correct answer equals one point. Um, while both myself and Matthew have 90 seconds on each MSR, we both also have the help in the form of three lifelines. These lifelines can be used at any stage during battle and also pause the 90 second timer. Each lifeline can only be used once and the lifelines are as follows. Question, where the hot seat haver gets to ask a yes or no question. Second opinion, where a second review is given to the warm chair sitter. And genre, where the genre of the game is revealed to the one with the warm arse. So, Matthew, this week's theme, because of the PlayStation 5 coming out, the mm. Xbox Series X, you know, all these new consoles <laughs> for a PC show, a lot of console chat. But... Uh, because of the new consoles coming out, we were thinking, well, why not somehow, let's have a look at that, something related to consoles. So what we've done is the, my three Steam reviews and hopefully Matthew's three Steam reviews are all video games that originally came out on consoles and then later came to PC. Yeah. So, uh, and we've decided that to kind of be a little bit nicer when it comes to Game, game name, game of the year, definitive edition, fucking complete collection, com ultimate edition, whatever. Uh, just the name of the game, really. Because uh, like, if 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 a, if the PC edition has you know definitive one at the end, it's probably going to be the only one. You know, it, when it comes to these terms. So now that we've all that sorted, uh, Matthew would. Uh, would you like your very first Mystery Steam review? Hit me up. I know my consoles, so I'm going to do well this week. Mm. Not for a change. You're telling me this stink burger won some <laughs> oh, sort Jesus. of video game award? <laughs> for what? Most regrettable purchase? You can't configure the controls, strike one. Literally no explanation on how to progress in the game or how to use your character's ability, strike two. Borderline monochromatic colour scheme and no speech, strike three. And that is from Bacon Bonanza. It's, uh, you'll be surprised to hear, not recommended. <laughs> point 0.4 hours on record and point 0.2 hours at review time. Matthew, your 90 seconds starts now. Stink burger. <laughs> Excellent use of stink burger. I mean, this could be many things because the configure your controls, like, I see that on so many of these Steam reviews and I didn't even know it was an issue with half these games. How the progress or how to use your character's ability. I don't really know what... Okay. And, and the, monochromatic makes, the monochromatic makes me think like... Like Limbo or Inside. 
but if you can't work out how inside works, you are so thick, I don't know how you r- manage to operate a PC to write this review. Like, it's not com- <laughs> If it's you're not watching Beard and Bonanza, uh, we apologise. No, I mean, uh, it really isn't complicated. Um... I'm trying to think of other con- famously monochromatic... Because he says almost monochromatic. Inside is monochromatic, I think. But then, as we've established, Bacon Van Anza might be an idiot. So maybe he doesn't know what almost means. You You're know 20 what? seconds? Screw it. I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go inside. I think it was on Xbox first. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. All right then. If it's limbo, I'll be, I'll be pretty cross. But uh, inside's more complicated than limbo. So bacon bonanza has led you down. You were thinking play dead, either limbo or inside, and mm. you've ended up with I can't actually. Did you say inside? You did. I you said did inside. inside. Uh, and I can tell you, Matthew, that inside is. The wrong answer. Oh, piss. What is it? The correct answer was Journey. Monocro... Oh, Bacon... Ba- ha- Bacon Bonanza doesn't... Oh, Bacon Bonanza. You're the stink burger, sir. You are a stink burger. Well, if you think about all that Bacon He's Bonanza not has this, said... The, I, the, the chances of him watching this, I've seen the figures, are unlikely. Um, but if you are Bacon Bonanza or friends of Bacon Bonanza, either punch yourself in the face or punch him in the face or her. Um, rancid. Monochromatic. That's a game ripe and rich with colour. Well, well, excuse me. To be fair, they only did, they only played 0.4 hours, was it? So maybe they only got to the, Imagine maybe they just so saw dim, sand. You don't know how, oh, like, what a. You know? Absolute fool. I don't mind losing to, 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 to like just a pure slice of nonsense. Learn what words mean, you motherfucker. Uh, Matthew, could I have my first Fucking Mystery Steam bacon review, bonanza. please? The only game where you can eat pie, be fat, and still do good for the world. That's Johnny O. Recommended with 21 hours on record. 17.9 at the time of review. Okay, time starts now. The only game where you can eat pie... Be fat and still too good for the world. So you're a fat video game character. The only game you can eat pie, be fat and still do good for the world. So you're not some sort of like anti-hero. Uh, still do good for the world. Eat pie. <laughs> yeah, you're certainly reading words out of this review. <laughs> oh, um... I'm pretty sure this game featured for some reason on this show before. I can't remember why. But I'm pretty... So the only one... Because, like, do good for the world. Because I was thinking, is it some sort of, like, um, the open world game or whatever where, I don't know, you eat, but then you, like, there's often, like, ludonarrative dissonance. And I just thought, is it the wonderful 101? Because I know there's a big lad in... The group as a green mm. wearing green la- uh, big lad. Do they eat pie? I'm not sure, uh, but they are definitely superheroes. Do you know what, Matthew? I think I might go with the wonderful 101. Uh, Is that uh, your final answer? Yeah. Do you know what? The wonderful 101. Final answer. It's your final answer. Final answer. Wonderful 101. Does wonderful 101 feature? A fat boy who eats pie <laughs> and still does good for the world. Poor, poor, if you're watching, fat boy. <laughs> it does feature a fat boy, but does that make this game the correct game? The correct answer is Fable The Lost Chapters. Uh... Wrong fat boy. Wrong fat boy. Wrong fat boy, wrong. Uh, <laughs> Very good. Oh, well. Um, I wouldn't have gotten that anyway, so... 
That's okay. You really need food sure. and get, you can get fatter or thinner in Fable. Good. <laughs> um, Matthew, would you like your second mystery Steam review? I do. I don't know instantly why my face has gone so shadowy. Uh, I apologize. That's okay. It looks, looks moody. I like it. It's, it's yeah. a good look. Clunky, bad camera, and lost me after the intro mission. Feels like a Sonic game with ninjas. Would not recommend. And that's from Bard Sucks. Uh, <laughs> indeed, it isn't recommended. Uh, and they played it for 3.9 hours and played 0.8 hours at time of review. And your time starts now. Oh my word. That is a Sonic game with ninjas. Don't know what their problem is. It sounds great. It hit, hit me up with a second a second clue. I need to get straight Ooh, in there with it. All right, then. Oh, wow, so you have dark. gone dark. Why am I so dark? What is going on? <laughs> um, right. <laughs> what did, what did you I don't know want? why I'm turning into a silhouette. Uh, second opinion, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, the second opinion of this game. Let me pull it up. <laughs> I'm so sorry about this, viewers. Uh, it is... Okay, second opinion. Um, they played it for 24.4 hours. It's recommended. Uh, and they said, Fruit Ninja Edgy Metal Edition. And your timer restarts uh, now. Fruit Ninja Edgy, edgy. Metal Edition. Well, that may, I know the only game that I can think of with like chopping up fruit is um well fruit ninja uh is um Metal Gear Rising Revengeance but I thought that was on PC as well uh, at start I can't remember and maybe it wasn't no it was on console first it could be that I don't think it's like Sonic again I mean I often get thrown because I forget that people are, can be stupid and that their reviews are maybe just wide on the mark rather than misleading. Um, is it like Sonic? He's quite fast, admittedly. He runs in quite a straight line, but it's still a platinum action game. It's not as dumb as it's not as dumb and bad as all Sonic games. Fifteen seconds, Matthew. <laughs> I'm gonna say Metal Gear. Rising Revengeance. I hope that's what it's called. It's got a really <laughs> fucked up name. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. If it's Metal Gear Solid Rising Revengeance. So, Matthew, you <laughs> uh, eventually ended up on Metal Gear Rising Revengeance after yeah. using your second opinion lifeline. Fruit Ninja, you were thought there was maybe some chopping up of fruit in Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. You've got very close. Very I'm trying to likely. stop my face from being so dark. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you that Metal Gear Rising Revengeance is yes. the right answer. Well done. Look at my big smug old face. Congratulations. I, I didn't think that was an unfair... Because he is fast. And it has a like, famously shit camera. Uh, that's why I never yeah, really fully got it, Like I would say it's nuanced, where Sonic is like the enemy of nuance. I'd say Sonic is better than Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. But, you know, oh, you, well, you're, you're, um, you're an imbecile. <laughs> no, that's correct. I think you'll find that's the correct answer. Uh, uh, well, actually, no, it, it is. Um, it, Matthew, mm. hold on. I'll change the <laughs> score. Uh, just change here. Uh, correct. There you go. It's there for everyone to see. Column is right. Uh, Matthew. Change it back to zero. That's I it. have. Can, do you, <laughs> <laughs> there's no fun, no time for fun here. Uh, Matthew, can I have my second mystery Steam review, please? Yes, you can. Anti corporate environmentalist propaganda, says Ooh. Jackie Moon. Not recommended after 1.4 hours on record. Time starts now. Uh, Jackie Moon. Anti-corporate, environmentalist propaganda. So is it a farming game? Environmentalist. Um, farming games. <laughs> farming games on PC that were first on other platforms. 
Nystargia was first on PC. You got something in the lifelines. I do. I'm just thinking... Uh, I think the second opinion would... Would I benefit mostly from that? Because genre... Because if it's not... Yeah, I'm going to pause the timer. Can I have my second opinion, Matthew, please? Oh. I think vital. Only thing that sucks is making a stupid Square Enix account. Ooh, okay, timer restarts now. A stupid Square Enix account. Square Enix, um, anti-corporate environment, uh... Oh, Jesus, what Square Enix game came? <sighs> See, I don't know the Final Fantasies that well. Which Final Fantasy came to PC after... Well, quite a lot of them, actually, didn't they? Uh, I think I'm going to have to take a stab at... Uh, what was the recent one? Wasn't it 10? I think recently came to PC. <sighs> I'm going to have to... Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to I think I'm gonna have to go with 10. I don't have anything else, Matthew. I think Final Fantasy X. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. Final answer? Final Fantasy X? You thought it was a farming simulation game? Until a second opinion pushed you towards Square Enix. But does Final Fantasy X have an anti-corporate environmentalist bent? <laughs> the correct answer is... Come on, come on. Final. Fantasy Seven. Oh! Oh. It does actually. I did know yeah. that. Yeah, quite famously. That's okay. I'm Final glad Fantasy. that we got away from. I thought you were really going to shit the bed with that farming simulator. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ah. Uh... Final Fantasy is shite anyway. Um, so who cares? Uh, Matthew, would you like <laughs> would you like your third mystery Steam review for the win? Yeah, go on then. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater with Guns. <laughs> 10 out of 10. And that's from Crowman. Or Crowman. Uh, it is recommended. 83.1 hours on record. 78.2 hours a time review. review. Your time, Matthew, starts now. Fuck me. All right. It's hit me with a genre. Oh, hit you with my genre stick. Uh, let me just... Why am I so shadowy? Uh, who knows? <laughs> now I'm like a James Bond villain. Uh, We've been expecting you, Mr. Bond. So the, the genre of this video game is... Uh, it is, according to wikipedia.org, an action-adventure... Shooter video game. Would you like to use your while I'm here? Would you like to use your question or? Yeah, I'll, I'll use my question. Okay. Um, are you on foot in this game? Can you be a little bit more specific or do you want me to answer that question? Like, is your character on... Does your character ride on or in a vehicle? For, um, for the majority of the game? Uh, no. Okay. So it's not like Tony Hawk? No. It's not a literal... We're on, okay, we're not the, doing the time. The timer restarts? No. So we're not talking about a literal skateboard, I don't think. Weirdly, when you said Tony Hawk's with guns, the thing that popped into my head was a game called The Club, which was like uh, a chaining score attack game, like Tony Hawk. Like, you had to do it in, like, one long combo. So now I'm thinking of games where you combo movement together, but you've got guns. It's not Mirror's Edge. That was on PC. Uh, I think that was on the same time anyway. Club was definitely on 360, but then did it come to PC? That's quite a niche choice for you as well, unless you've really gone back into the... Hmm. Like Tony Hawk. 
with guns. 30 seconds. Oh, I hope it's not something obvious nintendo -y. I only thought Xbox and Sony, really, for mine. Um, I didn't. I wasn't really thinking on Nintendo lines. I don't think it's that either. I, I, I don't really know what this is. I'm going to say the, the club from a combo perspective. I don't think that's right, but I'm going to say the club. Is that your final answer? That's right. No, it's not. <gasps> what? <laughs> Bullet, bulletproof. Matthew, you broke me there, wasn't it? <laughs> no, it's not. I'm so, I, I'm sorry, I have to accept the club. You have to accept the club? Oh, it's going to be that fucking John Woo game, isn't it? It's going to be that bulletproof or whatever it's called. Oh, I have to but fuck it. The club, You've Matthew. got to stick with the club because I know we hit zero when I said the club. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Look, it was a stressful and time it's not for all of us. It's called strength. It's going to be. I said the club, and that's my final answer. But it's going to be John Woo's stranglehold, I think. Okay, okay. But well, I said the club. After using your genre and your question lifelines, uh, good question as well to get away from, you know, skate or whatever. Um, well, skate doesn't have gun. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, you've ended up on the club. But oh, so shit. What a in shit. In reality. Answer. You've actually said you think it is John Woo's stranglehold. <laughs> yeah. But indeed, but the club I, was your was your final yeah. answer. So, Matthew, I can tell you that the club is the wrong answer. I hope it isn't. If it is stranglehold, I can tell you that stranglehold is the wrong answer. Oh, okay, fine. Doesn't matter. The correct answer is Sunset Overdrive. Oh. oh. Good. Get it? Grinding. Yeah, and... good. That's a good, mm. that's a, that's a fair review. I can't get too cross about that. I was, thought I was going to have to throw a tantrum there and mm. maybe threaten to kill you. <laughs> yeah, but it, was, but it was, you know, very fair review from... It's more Overwatch. ominous if I do it from the shadow. Uh, very much so, and when it's out of focus as well. <laughs> Uh, Matthew, can I have my final Mystery Steam review, please? You will die. This is a great elevator simulator. The sci-fi minigame is pretty good too, says Puddles. They recommend it. 33.7 hours, only 14.6 at the time of review. Yeah, time starts now. I know what this is straight away. Um, but I do have lifelines. Well, don't waste my fucking time. If you know what it is. <laughs> Come on, don't waste my fucking time, uh, mister. Oh, I know what it is, but oh, I've got some, you know. However, the only thing I'm slightly worried about is I don't know. I'm pretty sure this is the first one. Because, Mass Effect, just in case. Uh, I'm pretty sure because the famously, the, the, you were in the, when you were, went in the lift, it took forever. Mm, um, mm. I, the first one definitely was on 360 first and then came to PC afterwards. I think the second and third were um, were day and date, mm, I think. Mm. But I'm going to pause the timer because, look, you know, while I'm here, might as well. So, like, let's make sure. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a question, Matthew. Uh, and the question is, is this Mass Effect? I can't ask you that, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> is this part... Is this, am I allowed to ask this? Is this the first game in a trilogy? <laughs> it's a yes or no. You can't, you can't pull your, mm, let me check. Uh, it might be, I'm not sure. Mm, no. What? No. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna. Uh... Oh shit! Well, no, it's a. It could be. <laughs> you motherfucker! <laughs> it's very. It's. Don't Andromeda is not. Uh, all right, okay. Uh, I'm gonna. I don't have to restart the timer, really. Um, Mass Effect is my answer, Matthew. Chris. That's your final answer. Uh, yes, Mass Effect. You seem very confident this is Mass Effect because it it did indeed have an elevator. 
However, you've asked if it was part of a trilogy, <laughs> to which I said no. <laughs> but yet, you stick with Mass Effect. Sneaky bastard. <laughs> it's almost like you don't believe me. Uh, the correct answer is Mass Effect. Trying to pass off Andromeda <laughs> as part. <laughs> It's the first part of an ongoing series. It's not a quadrilogy, Matthew. It's a quadrilogy. It's like not. an alien quadrilogy. It is, yeah. <laughs> it is not. Another draw. It keeps going down. I think, was it three, three all, two all? Now it's one all. So we might be back to like no scores from next week. We'll see. <laughs> Yes, Burning Questions is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where we turn to you, our lovely uh, PC Gaming Week spot consumer, and look for your correspondence. You can email us at any stage throughout the week, weekspot at rockpapershotgun.com or typically what I'll do is the day before or before we... we uh, do the week spot, I will put a post on the YouTube discussion tab thing for Rock, Paper, Shotgun. So, Matthew, uh, we have a few questions here. Uh, One from John, who asks, I'm eating this while eating a bowl of Cheerios, the goat of cereals. What is your favourite breakfast cereal? They're eating this as they're eating this, or they're watching this as they're eating this. Uh, it says I'm eating this while eating a bowl of Cheerios. <laughs> eating I think a they, week spot. I think they just got very, they got very excited by the Cheerios. They just yeah. couldn't take their mind off of the, the act of eating. Um, <laughs> so, all been there. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, your favourite breakfast cereal, Matthew? Um, I'm a bit of a child when it comes to my diet. I, I still quite like... Sugary, um, chocolatey. Nom, nom, yeah, nom, 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 I nom. don't like Cocoa Pop. I don't like Kellogg's Cocoa Pops. You uh, fucking like, lunatic. What? I, Why? Like, I like Sainsbury's own brand. They're Choco Pops, I think they're called. I believe so, yeah. Uh, I prefer them. I think they're nicer. I, I find, uh, uh, I don't know, something slightly off about the flavour of Cocoa Pops. Also, I don't trust uh, Coco Monkey. No. Uh, he You're seems, always a fan of the crocodile instead. He, he seems <laughs> very suspicious figure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't know. They're terrible. If you read the nutritional information, it's just like, oh, like, oh bre- God. Cereal, it shouldn't All be. cereal is bad. It's I awful. Think. Like even bran flakes <laughs> is shy. Like you shouldn't have, be having <laughs> cereal in the morning. It's not, it shouldn't it's, be. It's uh, not good. Um, I, 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 I obsess over cereal and I've obsessed over like, probably 15 different brands of cereal in my life. You know, I've gone through different periods where I've fanatically eaten one thing and then changed track. Currently, mm-hmm. it's Cocoa Pops. Um, I've had Frosties uh, patches before. Uh, honey Nut Corn Flakes. Special K. Can't go oh, wrong with that. K, Special K is overlooked a lot of the time, yeah. Special K is nice. Yeah, I like, I like Special K. Uh, I, not I the am... one with the nasty berries, though. Uh, oh yeah, that's shite. Yeah, that is shite. Um, I am a big, big cereal fan. Uh, I Frosties was my downfall in my childhood. I fucking loved Frosties. And I would have a bowl in the morning, fucking ginormous, <laughs> and a bowl every evening at about eight o'clock, again, ginormous. Um, because again, cereal... They're not, it's not for, it's for whatever you want because it's just sugar in a bowl, especially these yeah. types of cereals. Um, I, I ate a lot more evening cereal um, before I lived with my wife. So uh, I can't do that anymore because I feel like she would judge me. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I I, uh, I would be the same. Um, but at, at the minute, I'm going through a, a bit of a... Uh, feels like a, a comeback tour, a, a, um, a reunion with a crunchy nut. Now, I hate 
nuts of all kind. Peanut, Brazil nut, cashew. Please, please don't I, list I, all I, the I'm nuts. going to, hold on, I'm going to list, I'm going to list every please single nut. Please don't list them. We, we know what you're talking about when you say all, nuts. All nuts. Except for no. the ones with, I, you know, the, the salted ones, I just like, if somebody has them in the pub, I'll take one, suck it, spit it out. Uh, oh, but, you suck the salt off a pub nut. But, but, crunchy nuts. They're covered in piss. Crunchy, not one off the ground. But no, like, they're covered in piss because people go to the toilets, don't wash their hands, put them in the communal nuts. Those nuts. Oh, no, like, no, 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 no. I mean, like, like piss nuts. Not, not, not in a packet. You nuts buy a, a packet of nuts just to suck the salt no, off them. No, if so. Anyway, crunchy nut, right? I So I've established, don't like nuts. Don't eat piss nuts. I don't like them either. Um, but crunchy piss nuts. Crunch, crunchy nut. I don't think they taste of nut. I just think they taste of like sugary uh, uh, cornflakes. They've got honey as well, right? They're, they're, yeah, they're like honey, but but they're just called crunchy nut. No, but I maybe don't think... actually, what this teaches you is that you do like nuts, and no. you're just being a big baby. No, no, I don't. No, I won't hear it, man. You, you actually like the, to me. What you just said is, I don't like nuts, but I eat something which proves. I actually like nuts. But well, also, it's a great story. also one thing I really enjoy, satay. I love a chicken satay. Yeah, fucking you fucking hate love nuts. nuts. I'm nuts afraid, I, I hate to break this to you. Nuts. You love peanuts. No. You love no. peanuts. Yes. No. No. Uh, Face our, up to it. Our next question is from Brian. Uh, Brian asks, what is the game that you think other critics got wrong? Obviously, everyone has a, has an opinion but basically, what is the best game that has a Metacritic score that's too low or the worst game that has a Metacritic score that's too high? And that's from Brian. Thank Ooh. you, Brian. Um, interesting, because, yeah, you know, everyone has an opinion. Uh, so we'll preface everything we're about to say with that, because I'm sure there would be other people that would say, Colin was totally wrong on that. Matthew was totally wrong on that. The game that first comes to my mind, purely because I reviewed it, uh, is Detroit Become Human. Because for me, that's a game that, uh, like, you know, if you look at the Metacritic, it's, I think it's low 80s, high 70s, low 80s. That is staggering <laughs> for that game. <laughs> staggering. It is a very pretty game. Like, it's, we- like, it looks really nice. But that's kind of all I can give it. Yeah, like the, it's, it's, it's asking people to review a story when they've probably never read a book. It's just like, <laughs> like the, the, it's a lot of dim bulbs in this industry. So, Column. so <laughs> it is so silly. Uh, like the bit where they sing, if you haven't played it. But like, it is just so ludicrous and so obviously poor faced. But it's just not. I don't know, it's not evocative. It's very obvious. Uh, that's one that comes to mind for too high. Uh, I'll try and think of it. Do you, do you have any, Matthew? I, I, like, it's not a PC game, but there was, I reviewed a game on the Nintendo DS made by Platinum Games, um, or co-produced by Platinum Games, called Infinite Space, which was like this giant epic space odyssey where you built a spaceship and it had quite confusing spaceship kind of almost like uh, like naval battles in space. Mm. Um, I thought it was absolutely fantastic, like incredibly deep. I thought the story was like absolutely hilarious. Like it had these mad platinum characters and loads of people just absolutely shat on it um, because it was quite difficult and unforgiving. But if you kind of punched through it and worked out like actually how to play it and what it wanted you to do, it didn't explain itself, admittedly. Mm. Um, but I I really loved that game and I always thought it should be held in quite a uh, high regard, but it was um, misunderstood. It <laughs> um, um, I, I, actually, you've reminded me a little bit of... Uh, I mean, I'd have to check actually what it's got, but... Uh, I would say Alien Isolation should probably, whatever it has, I'll have a look here, see what it is on Metacritic, but whatever it is, it should probably be higher. Because that well, that's game... Cause the, that's because the Brit they, reviewers all liked it and all the American reviewers... Wasn't it such really an odd underrated. split? So for those that aren't aware, when Alien Isolation came out, because Christ, it was six years ago, 
there was a weird split where British publications um, really liked the game, absolutely raved about it, and a lot of American publications didn't like it. And I don't think I've seen that since, or even before. Like, it was just such a weird line in the sand uh, that happened. But Alien Isolation has 81, which I suppose is quite hot. I'd still, you know, I think it's ex- It's one of the best games of the last 10 years. It's excellent. People who say it's too long are impatient and but, shit. Um, I think it's excellent. The, the, the one I always think, and, and this caused me great grief when I was working on Nintendo magazines, uh, I, I really don't get Pokemon. I think I think the I think the Pokemon games are universally over it. I I think they're I just I find them totally charmless. I find them really basic. Actually, that's not that's not true. I think that they're very well aimed at kids. I do not understand my peers enjoying them for themselves. Like I just find the writing in them so babyish and inane. I okay. I, I just can't I can't deal with it. It's a world which is to me like. Just repels every adult sensibility I have. Um, I have a follow-up question in a minute, but carry on. Yeah, Pokemon. Or just um, like, oh, so. Uh, do you like Animal Crossing? Uh I don't <laughs> mind. I don't. Why mind is that different? It. I, I don't play it religiously. Uh, it's got. A, it's 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 funny. It's actually got a really sharp writing okay. in it. Okay. Um, it's a very different thing. I know, I'm not saying, uh, I guess it's unfair. Like Pokemon's not bad. It's just, I just don't think, I don't really understand what other adults see in it. Like, I think it's a nostalgia they bring with them from their childhood. I didn't really like it. I think it it's I was, an element of that, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I didn't really have that nostalgia as a kid. I don't, I don't bring it with me. But when I interviewed the team behind it, they talk about it in a really infantile way. You know, they're like, some of the monsters are cool for the boys and some of them are cute for the girls. And you're like, you're making a game for seven-year-olds. And yet I've got all these 30-year-old mates saying, oh, actually, it's got this really deep, like, meta game. And you're like, yeah, it's, it's, it's made for children. <laughs> that, it's, it's, I don't accept that at all. It's not cool. It's not did a cool the, thing to be did, interested in. Did, why, it's, a, why, it's, a baby, whilst, it's a baby's game. Whilst maybe not a direct quote, and I'm not asking you to say that it was... Is that pretty close to what they said? Yeah, pretty. Yeah, I like they said. I specifically remember saying, "Cool for the boys, cute for the girls." They're talking about you like your children. They think children are playing their game, and you can understand that when you see that their character design is a fucking ice cream with eyes. Mm. Like, that is I not mean, to something... be fair, we we spoke about Coco Pops, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I know, but like, if it was gonna be adult stuff, it would be like a sofa with eyes. You yeah, know? and or you can't you, can, you can't eat Pokemon. If you could, then maybe or or a wheel lock for a car with eyes. Ooh, you know, it would, that be, would be good. A, a, adult concerns for a the tax, adult mind. A, t- a tax return. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just drive. And I license. look at it and I'm like, don't you see that this is this is for children? And they're like, wow, it's really recaptured the magic. I never have uh, less respect for my friends and peers than when they. Continuously when Pokemon comes give out. <laughs> Pokemon great reviews, but that's and that made writing a regular Pokemon section in Endgamer pretty difficult. <laughs> and our final question uh, comes from David. David says, "Hello, weak spot men. Nintendo have Mario, Microsoft have Master Chief, and Sony tried with Crash Bandicoot, and then Lara Croft, and then nothing. Consoles don't have mascots anymore, do they? It's a thing from a bygone era." So my burning question is, if PC gaming was to have a mascot, who would it be and why? Cheers, David. There's one quite obvious one that comes to my mind, but I don't know, does it shut down the conversation straight away? I don't know. I mean, let's... Gordon Freeman? Oh, Gordon Freeman. I was thinking uh, Clippy, the the paperclip from Word. (laughs) Okay, actually, did did uh, was it David? Did he actually say P- he said PC gaming? To be fair, okay, rather than PCs. PC uh, yeah, G- yeah, Gordon, Gordon Freeman Freeman's- comes to my mind because of I suppose the cultural relevance of Half Life, how people still to this day love that game. How uh, when Half Life Alex was being teased, people were losing. Oh my God, it's going to be Half Life Three I- and. 
Yeah, no. that's that's fair. Maybe uh, you see on a lot of internet forums where they have avatars, a lot of people have JC Denton from Deus Ex, mm-hmm. which I always think sort of tells you a lot, you know, tells you a lot about that person, that grim little face. Um, you know, prone to conspiracy theories and whatnot. Um, <laughs> uh, other classic DC movies, they're pretty good. So I suppose like, like if you look at say strategy games, like what, what mascot would you have from Gandhi from civilization? Like, you know, <laughs> alongside Master Chief and Crash Bandicoot. Like Yeah, I mean like in terms of like iconography, which feel quite key to PC, like Gordon Freeman's pretty good. Some of the stuff in Portal, like the compa- even though that's on console as well, like the companion cube. Mm. I'd say is like quite an iconic thing that has broken out of its out of its game. Um, so that's yeah. like a- anything. Uh, I suppose PC exclusives aren't as common. I'm gonna say yeah, well, they just, uh, as don't, like so. So and I mean even even Half Life, you know, with the orange box. Yeah, I guess. Um, Max Payne's face. Like Sam Lake. Sam Lake is the mascot for PC gaming. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever the face. What's the, what expression is it? It's kind of... <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. Would Max Payne have been as famous if his face had been? <laughs> Just like... Uh, uh, thank you very much to uh, everyone for uh, sending your questions in. If you want to get your questions in to the Peace Gaming Week Spot, you can email us at any stage throughout the week. Week Spot, W E E K Spot at rockpapershotgun.com. So. Thank you very much. That just about does it for this edition of the PC Gaming Week Spot. Um, slightly longer than uh, anticipated, I think. That's like bollocks on about James uh, Bond. Apologies. No, not at all. It was, a, shit. it was a pleasure. I, I really enjoyed bollocking on about James Bond, the Game Awards, everything. It was, it was, quite, it was quite good. <laughs> so if you want to uh, some extra Colin and Matthew after you finish this episode of the Peace Gaming Week Spot, you can follow us on social media. I am at Colin underscore Ahern. And Matthew is at Mr. Basil underscore Pesto. You can also talk to some like-minded people on Discord, discord.gg forward slash rock, paper, shotgun. Lovely folks over there, so get chatting. Also, if you're here on YouTube, why not like, comment, subscribe, and then ring that bell. Then you'll be notified of all future videos and PC Gaming Week Spot and all that kind of stuff. But uh, for all of your PC Gaming needs, keep it on rock, paper, shotgun. Dot. Come. Uh, Matthew, another episode of the Piece of Gaming Week Smart Down. It was a pleasure to chat to you about James Bond, as I said. Uh, is there anything else no, you'd like to... No, but does it better. <laughs> Would you like to give Let's people a rendition? For the rest. Mm-hmm. Carry on. Nobody does it half as good as you. Maybe you're the best. And now it is time for my least favourite part of the show. This is the part of the show where we must bid the listener the viewer, the consumer, adieu. So say goodbye, Matthew Castle. Goodbye. And say goodbye, Colin Mahern, Sloan, Guffold.